Onessa Bulyushmich Kustera. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah. We're here to talk about the Bosnian genocide. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, a series of horrific wars were fought across the Balkans, and yet my generation were being born at that time. We have no memory mm. of it happening. Can you give an explanation, a sort of a way in for someone, for a lot of people who mm -hmm. might not be familiar with what happened? What did happen? Yeah, so uh, I don't know how many are familiar, but before all of this, the country was called Yugoslavia. It was the uh, Federal Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. Um, we had a leader, uh, Josip Broz Tito. Um, for a really long time, the country functioned almost perfectly. Um, you know, free healthcare, jobs, Everybody got along, various ethnicities and religious. I mean, there was, you know, it was a country full of people who spoke different languages, believed different things, but grew up side by side. Um, in 1980, Tito died, and following that, new leadership came in um, under who some people may have heard of, Slobodan Milosevic. Um, his party, and him in particular, um, utilized nationalism as a way to garner support. Um, so we started seeing a rise in nationalism, we started seeing a rise in hateful rhetoric. This is in the late 80s. Um, speeches that were, you know, um, instigating hatred of one minority towards another. Um, all sorts of things. So slowly, the countries, or the federations, as they were part of Yugoslavia, um, started to, you know, get worried, and um, they started to declare their independence. Um, Tito was dead, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia didn't really exist as it had been existing for such a long time, and so people wanted out. Um, Croatia and Slovenia declared independence, and then eventually, the rest of the countries followed, Bosnia being one of them. Um, so the first, the, the Serbian army first attacked Slovenia, however, there wasn't a, a lot of Serbs living there, so that sort of ended and trickled down fairly fast. Their next step was Croatia and Bosnia. Once Bosnia declared independence from, um, from Yugoslavia, that's basically when it all started. Meanwhile, during this entire time within Bosnia itself, a completely different system was being set up as well. Um, a system that was completely based on ethno-nationalistic identities, right? So you had the Bosnians, the Serbs, the Croatians, or, or really at that time there were, you know, Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Catholics, Bosnian Christians. Um, Bosnian Romas, Bosnian Jews, they all lived fine. And then this referendum came along asking for independence, which most of the country said yes, which, which is why it declared independence. However, the Bosnian-Serbian leadership was not happy, and they did not want independence. They wanted their own part of the land, and they wanted to belong to Serbia, and they wanted together to be Yugoslavia. So it started out slow, as these things usually do. It started with some propaganda. It started with a lot of Islamophobia, a lot of them versus us rhetoric. And then um, in January of 92 is sort of when things started to really spiral. Now by April, on April 6th is actually when the rest of the world accepted Bosnia's independence. And that is also the same day that's by many considered the actual start of the siege of Sarajevo. So the capital city of Bosnia, Sarajevo, was completely surrounded by Serb, uh, the Serbian army and Serb forces. They cut off water, electricity, food, people couldn't get in or out. And they started sort of doing the same throughout other places within the country. Um, anywhere that was a you know mostly Bosnian Muslim populated village or town, the Serbian forces would come after it. Um, in some places like Prijedor, uh, a very small, large Bosnian Muslim population there, they would build concentration camps. Um, but they started again slowly. The first thing that they did was, you know, they took over 
the leadership within the city and um, they said, okay, if you're not a Serb, you're gonna put a white flag in front of your house. And when you step outside of your house, you're gonna wear, wear a white armband. And then, you know, they utilized the radio and news as much as they could to sort of spread this propaganda to, to garner more support from people who grew up with each other, right? And it was, listen, if you don't do this, if you don't join us, they're gonna kill you. They're gonna bring Sharia law. They're gonna, you know, do this or do that. And, you know, the Serbian population suffered a lot in World War II as well. They were, um, under the Ustasha regime, they were imprisoned in Yasinovitz concentration camp. That was another thing that they utilized. They were, you know, like, remember what happened to you in World War II? It's gonna happen again. These guys are gonna do it to you this time. So either you do it or they're gonna do it, but you gotta kill them. There's a, there's a fitting historical context because the Bosnian genocide is the first genocide in Europe since the defeat of Nazism. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to focus on Sarajevo for the moment, mm -hmm. if we could. Yeah. Could you perhaps start by explaining the geography of the area and explain how, because the city was encircled, the Serbian forces essentially had a field of view over the entire city because mm -hmm. it sits below, doesn't it? It's sort of That's, surrounded by hills. It's basically, Sarajevo is in a valley, right? And so it's surrounded by these beautiful mountains and, and hills. And it sits in a valley, so it's like a whole circle. So when they surrounded it, I mean, that was it for Sarajevo. The only thing that basically they could do was get the army and try to push back as much as possible so that they don't actually get within the city. Because had they done that, I mean, it would have been over. So because of their, the position of the city and because they were able to so fully um, you know, surround it um, and access electricity and access water points, access all of that stuff and turn it off and make sure that we are literally you know, completely closed off from the rest of the world and from any help, um, I mean, they were able to then enact their, this sort of uh, campaign of terrorism, which is where every single day, 300, sometimes more, shells would hit Sarajevo per day on one of the largest um, uh, historical, one, one of the biggest days um, was on July 22nd, 1993. That day alone, over 3,700 shell impacts hit the city. So they're bombing it, they're throwing grenades, they're shelling it, and there's snipers everywhere. So it's just hell. Can you explain what's being targeted, if anything is being targeted? With this kind of fire, it's mm -hmm. indiscriminate, it's just falling on the city. It's, they targeted specifically cultural sites, um, sites of heritage. One of the biggest things of their propaganda was that Bosnians are not really Bosnians. Bosnia doesn't exist. They're all just Serbs or Croatian, depending on which nationalist you ask. They're either Serbs who converted to Islam or Croatians who converted to Islam, or they're Turks, right? But they're not really real, so it's completely okay that we do this to them because technically it actually all belongs to us. So one way to sort of make sure that that type of propaganda has effect is to target archival buildings that contain, you know, the history of the country, the history of the culture, the proof that, hey, we have been here, this is ours, and, you know, we have a long, beautiful, wonderful cultural history. In fact, we have a wonderful cultural history of it getting along with Serbia and Croatia, you know, but, um, so they, I, they were, very adamant about targeting libraries. The biggest library um, was just completely burnt down. And you know, the locals, the people who are also under sniper fire and the shelling campaign, right? They're trying to get the books and get as many archives as you could. But it's, I mean, we lost so much. In Sarajevo alone, after the war, they estimated that almost every single building sustained some sort of damage with close to 35,000 buildings being completely destroyed. Could you explain what happens to, let's say, a, you know, a regular house, a civilian house, mm -hmm. like if it takes an impact from a shell like that, mm -hmm. is there anything left afterwards? Like what kind of damage does it do? It depends. 
It depends on like the position they're shooting from and all of that stuff. In my case, my, um, my grandmother was a victim of one of those attacks. Um, this happened early on in the war, um, about 93, I believe it was. Um, they have a, a house in a neighborhood, well, we still have that house actually, but we, we had a house in the neighborhood and it's a very Muslim populated neighborhood. It's kind of up on the hills. Uh, beautiful place, you see the whole city, it's wonderful. But it made it a huge target, you know, for the Serbs because they know that it's a historically Muslim populated neighborhood. Um, so one day while my grandmother was upstairs um, and the rest of the family was sort of downstairs, she was, I don't know, doing laundry, cleaning something, because people are still trying to go and do the mundane tasks that everybody else does, right? So out of nowhere, a shell hit her house. Um, the top part of it was completely demolished and she died right on the spot. Um, but it, it depends, you know, with, with these are really old and sturdy buildings, I think that helps. So you, you'll see in pictures, some of them are completely, completely demolished. There is nothing there but the foundation maybe. And then some of them are, you know, here and there, but it's workable, so. So your family were trapped inside the city during the mm -hmm. siege. Yeah. Could you tell us more about your personal experience of that time? Because you were a young child when yeah. this was going on. Yeah, so I mean, and that was, that was the first thing I remember of my childhood. I don't really remember a childhood. Your grandmother's death war. is yeah. the first thing you remember. That's it. I mean, it was, I knew the fighting was going on. I knew, I, I would hear the bombs, obviously. I would hear the shelling, I would hear the snipers, but you know, being a kid and obviously being protected by my family, they would try to not tell me anything. You know, it's just get down to the basement, hide. So we were, we had no food, we had no water, we had no electricity. Um, we, we had nothing. And for so many of us, for example, for me, um, at the time I didn't quite know it yet, but my dad was in a concentration camp while this was going on. Um, some of my family is from Visegrad in eastern Bosnia, an area that was heavily impacted. And uh, my father, my grandfather, and my uncle were there when the fighting broke out and they were all imprisoned. And so, you know, being a really nosy child, I would overhear my mother crying, worrying what happened to him, where he is. And, um, you know, by sheer luck, somebody who made it out of there had showed up at our door um, and told my mom where he was. And so you know, or you believe that that's it. I'm never gonna see him again. It's, you know, he's gone. You know, my grandpa is gone, my uncle is gone. Um, and every single time, you know, somebody stepped out of the house. That, for me, that was like a feeling of like, okay, I'm never gonna see them again, you know? It's, it's done, it's gone. Um, but my, my father was really lucky because um, the Serbian soldier that um, basically stood at his post as security knew him. They went to school together and he had a change of heart in that he told him, run, I will not look, I can't do anything other than that, I will just pretend I didn't see you, run behind me and run as fast as you can. And so from Visegrad, which is quite a ways away from Sarajevo, my father walked and he went through the tunnels and he got back into Sarajevo. And he, wa he had at the time also um, a sharp null, um, a, a grenade fell next to him, um, causing sharp null to go inside his head and in his arms. The one in his head like, is still embedded, they can't take it out because if they would, he would completely die. So when he comes back to us, um, we, we didn't know initially um, that he had made it back. We just found out because, again, somebody at the hospital you know, risked their life to come like, through all those, sni those snipers and tell us. We found him. He's, you know, your husband is in the hospital and this is what happened to him and he survived. But yeah, that's, that was 
the normal. And it sounds weird because I, you know, for, for a really long time, I didn't realize that there were other types of childhoods. All I, th I thought, I internalized that experience to the point where I thought, well, this is what all children go to, you know? Because there was, and we were children, so of course we played, you know? We're in this dark, damp basement, always worrying about whether or not we're gonna uh, be, you know, whether the Serbian forces are gonna come up to our door and find us, whether the next bomb that hits is gonna be right, you know, on our building. I mean, the, the building that I grew up in, even now, it has not been repainted or anything done to it. It is full of shell impacts. So you're in there, you're hearing this, you're feeling this, and that is your day-to-day -day life, you know? And, and you're just a kid trying to play with your friends. So those of us who had toys, you know, we all shared it. If somebody got lucky enough to bring some food in, you know, everybody shared it, um, creates a special sort of bonding, I think, which is why I'm still friends with all of those people, even <laughs> though. Bet, yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, childhood in Sarajevo was dark. I'm sure. And you can probably elucidate on this a little bit more. But mm -hmm. as a child, I don't know, were you aware that children were being targeted and killed in Sarajevo? Because I know Sniper Alley, I'm sure that's, that's probably not what you called it when you mm -hmm. were younger, but you know, about 60 children were deliberately shot and killed by the snipers that you were just talking about there. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you aware that you were actually a target of the military forces as a child, or was that something that perhaps, as you were quite young, you were perhaps naive to? No, I knew. Um, I knew because I lived in the area where that was very close to. Um, and obviously I didn't go anywhere often, um, but there were occasions where, you know, either there was a ceasefire or they were doing talks, or the Americans were trying to get involved, or something along those lines. So it settled down a bit. Um, there were my grandmother was a vet, my other grandmother, my maternal one who was alive, um, thankfully and still is. Um, she was a very religious woman, um, so for her, the fact that the war was going on didn't matter. We're gonna go to mosque. It's Ramadan. We're fasting, even though we have nothing to eat anyway. <laughs> We're still gonna do it. But it was great, because it brought me so much joy. And also fear, because in order to get to the mosque, you had to actually get out and sort of run and be as fast as you can. It's not very far, it's, you know, my building is sort of here, the mosque is right there, and it's not even a real mosque. It's a mosque that the community at the time sort of set up so that people would have somewhere to go to and you're just running, you know, and so I saw it, you know, I saw snipers shooting at us. Um, on one occasion when my dad was still in a concentration camp and my grandmother was really ill and my mother had just given birth to my brother, I had to go and fill um, the gallons, the jugs of water up and um, occasionally the Red Cross or the city or whoever it was, they would bring these huge tanks of water from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, and you know, you sort of run out and you fill it up, you run back in, right? So I'm a kid, I know my mom can't do it, I know my grandma can't do it, and everybody else is, you know, either fighting or they're hiding or they're doing, or they're, you know, in concentration camps. So I felt obviously it was my duty to do this and um, we lived on the fifth floor. We had friends that lived on the fourth floor and they were doing it. So my parent, my mom just said, okay, just watch her. And we did. Uh, we filled up our water, we turned around and then we didn't realize it, but there was a sniper right next to the building. And nobody really knew how he had gotten in and whether this was like a rogue person. Um, and thankfully, you know, the army was notified and he was removed from that, but he did shoot at us, right? So I'm a child and he is shooting at me and I'm trying to run back in and, you know, just make it back to my family. And I turn around and you know, thankfully most of us made it, but some people got shot and all you see is blood and, you know, just for water.
that's all we were wanting to do was just get some water so um, we could survive. But yeah, no, I always knew and it always terrified me. And it, you know, it, it stayed with me for such a long time, obviously, even when the fighting settled and the war stopped because I, you know, I would just walk the street and be like, was that the person that shot at me? And, or did those people right there standing, did they imprison my dad in the concentration camp? Did they kill my uncle? You know, did they kill my godmother? Um, it was constant overthinking when you're not supposed to be thinking about that. You know, you should be thinking about school and who the cute guy is and <laughs> all of that stuff. Not that I didn't have those <laughs> thoughts as well. I didn't constantly think about it, but <laughs> mm -hmm. of course, um, I was still a child. <laughs> there's, there's, there's sort of um, the insidious nature of that terror, it has the mm. same effect as the propaganda, right? Yeah. That they're distributing to try and make people doubt each other, to suspect each other, to mm. drive these wedges and divisions between people. Yeah, it completely works, which is why, I mean, it worked in Hitler's Germany, right? So obviously it was going to work in Bosnia. And, and it's worked after Bosnia, it worked in Rwanda, you know, and in Rwanda they did the same thing, propaganda over the radio, right? Um, just inciting that sort of division and hatred and, and fear because you can't really have any of this without fear. And fear is the thing that's gonna keep, one, these people in power, the propaganda most, more easily acceptable, and especially people likely to take up arms. Because if you sit there and I tell you, hey, go and shoot this person, most people are not gonna do that because most people know that you know, killing and murder are morally wrong. But if I sit there and over months and months and months try to convince you how if you don't do this, your entire family is going to die, they're going to take your home, they're going to rape your whoever, you're going to do it eventually. It's going to convince you. So this wasn't a sudden thing. This wasn't even about ancient hatreds. You know, it's what academics on the Balkans love to bring up ancient hatreds. This was not an ancient hatreds issue. This was an issue of leaders, people in power, utilizing to the best of their ability propaganda and nationalism and instilling enough fear to turn neighbor against neighbor. There's just one final aspect of the siege in Sarajevo which I'd like to talk about, mm -hmm. which is um, the mortar attacks on the market. I think mm -hmm. there, were, there were two that were quite mm -hmm. severe. Could you explain sort of well, first of all, what happened in mm -hmm. both of those instances and then the wider significance of, of those attacks. Yeah, so um, the first, they both happened at the same market. It's Markala Mar Market. It's basically, you know, a place where people go to buy food, fresh veggies, stuff like that. Um, and the first attack happened in 93, I believe. About 60 people were killed. Um, it was, you know, it was a very obviously deliberate attack because from their position, they're able to see people are gathered, they're getting food, they're there. And, you know, the mortar attack hit and suddenly 60 people are dead, numerous others injured, you know, disabled. I mean, it was, it was a massacre. It's just blood everywhere. And, if you look at the pictures of it, of which some are online, I mean, it's just terrifying. The second uh, Markala massacre happened in 95. I can't remember the date Doesn't for matter. the life of me, but it was 95. And um, that one, again, same thing. People at the market getting the bare necessities that they needed um, and, you know, walking to and from place, you know, it, they weren't safe areas deemed like as with, with Srebrenica, which was deemed a safe area. They were just areas that people didn't think um, they would be shooting at, right? They were like, it's a market, there's children around, you know, there's families, elderly women, there's no men of, you know, military age. They're not gonna do it, right? Because their thing was always, well, we're only after the men of military age not civilians, that was their propaganda. But this was women and elderly and children. And again, 
the market killed um, a little bit of less but injured a lot more this time and it was a really big huge defining factor along with the Srebrenica um, genocide um, to open the involvement of America, the European Union, other European countries as well, uh, France and England. Um, it was sort of like a clear all for them to finally intervene and try to bring about the peace talks and end the siege and end the war, which took some time, but it was one of those first pushes for that to happen. D defining moments because of their horror and that's probably best encapsulated in what happened at Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could, it you, was could just you explain the, what happened there, the genocide that happened there? Yeah, the, the genocide in Srebrenica was um, a murder, a massacre of over 8,367 people within a matter of a day or two. It happened fast and it was brutal. Um, Srebrenica was declared a safe zone by the United Nations. It was uh, under the protec protection of the UN, I believe it was the Dutchman service, Dutch bat. Um, and so the people from around the areas were all making their way to Srebrenica. Um, they were told, that's what they were told on the radio, by the army, by the UN, you know, come here, it's safe. So these, this is basically an open camp of, of some sort um, where you have the UN, they're supposed to be protecting you, they're going to give you water and food. And it's all these people from these small villages in the area who had now seen, one, they had either seen their villages burn, they knew the Serbian forces were getting closer, they had already seen a lot of their families die, um, and other, you know, tragic events. And so they come there um, thinking they're safe. The Serb forces come and they take control of the camp. And they tell anybody who was a Bosnian, who was a Bosnian Muslim, to, if they had any weapons, to turn them over. And that they, they say, you know, we're going we're gonna to take care of the children and women. We're going to put them on a bus. We're going to send them off. Everything's going to be fine. There is videos of Ratko Mladic, who was convicted of genocide, saying that to people. Do not worry. Even giving candy to children, who he, then later he would be shooting at, right? And telling them, everything is going to be fine. We're just splitting you up. Don't worry. So the women, some of the women and children get put on these buses and they're supposed to go somewhere else. Because according to Ratko Mladic and Karadzic, this was their big win. Um, there is a video of Ratko Mladic also saying, you know, the time has come. Here we are in Srebrenica. It's time to avenge um, to get our revenge on the Turks. The Turk is, Turks is what they would call us because we were Muslim, we weren't actually Slavs, and we belonged to the Middle East and not to Bosnia. And so it was very deliberate, you know, him in that video openly saying like, yes, we're here, we're gonna get our revenge, we're gonna kill them all. And so they started to line men up men and boys and older men, it didn't matter if it was a, you know, 80 year old man or a four month old infant. In fact, the youngest victim of the genocide was a newborn, just literally seven days old. Didn't need, her parents didn't even have a chance to name her. So while that's happening, they also set up other camps in which women are being raped, people are being tortured um, from the people who were actually there. Um, you know, the, the survivors, the witnesses, in the books and testimonies at the ICTY that they've given, you know, we, there's no food, there's no water, it smells of blood and death, we can't move, we're scared, we're being split up from our families, and all through the night all we're hearing is screams of people being raped or tortured and eventually murdered. So this was obviously early July. By July 10th, I mean, it was completely under their control. 
they took the buses of women and children out and they started there's videos of this too they lined the men up and one by one they would shoot at them right in the head and some of the survivors currently that are out there only survived because they pretended to be dead. Some men escaped and they ran and they walked miles and miles to Tuzla to find safety. Through a minefield, in fact. So, the extent of the inhumanity at Srebrenica, can't, I can't ever fully describe it. You know, we have these academic books and works and we have videos and everything, but, and I had family in Sevenance as well, so for me it's, it's when I hear them talk and when they tell me exactly what they went through. That is, you know, I, I've been studying genocide for 10 years and I've been doing Bosnian activism or combating genocide denial activism for since I was 15 years old and I'm you know 30 years old now so it's it's 15 years of work plus my own experience and I can never truly understand it what amount of evil is required to, to commit the crimes they did in Srebrenica all over Bosnia because what happened in Srebrenica also happened in Visegrad, in Priedor, in Kozarac. I mean these they're small cities, small towns. And I think one, one huge thing that, you know, when, when I tell people 100,000 people were murdered, or over 100,000 people, depending on who you ask, were, were massacred throughout, the, throughout Bosnia. Um, and of that, you know, the majority is Bosniak Muslim civilians, right? That is a huge number of people. And then you get, you know, the 8,367 from, from Srebrenica, right? 10,000 in Sarajevo, um, 5,000 in Priedor. 5,000 or 10,000, it doesn't seem that much in comparison to the Rwandan genocide, for example, or even to the Holocaust, right? Um, but I think what people must understand is how tiny Bosnia is. You know, if you, if you look at Severance, that was a town of maybe 20,000 people. So eight, over 8,000 people being massacred. That's almost half of that population. So imagine, you know, half of the population of London being massacred. Mm. It's huge and it leaves such an effect that whether or not you were actually there or whether you had family there, you're, you really never recover from it. It's always going to stay with you. Did all of your family members in Trebrenica, did they survive? No. Can you explain what happened with the UN because as you said they sort of did nothing it's, it's almost it's morbid because the, their their intention of protecting these people and bringing them together is obviously effectively hastened yeah their murder mm. and then the Serbian forces come in and what are the UN doing whilst this is happening nothing they drink with them um, they, it was it was very recently that um, I believe the, the international courts decided that the Netherlands were partially responsible for the genocide due to their neglect um, in Srebrenica. Because it was a safe zone, because reinforcements weren't called, um, because of the way that they behaved themselves, um, it all sort of pointed to res responsibility. Because ultimately, the UN's responsibility was to protect the people who were in that area, right? They didn't have enough men, and they knew that the Serbian forces were in Eastern Bosnia, and that they would eventually try and, and get to Srebrenica. So they could have gotten more men there, but they didn't. Um, and when you know the Serbian forces showed up, when Ratko Mladic showed up, they, um, they sat down with them. And there's a picture of the general um, at the time, and I always forget his name, but um, the picture of him and Natko Mladic taking shots together as people are being raped and murdered outside. Then there is the graffiti and just the general sort of sense of racism and 
nationalism from those soldiers directly, you know, the people who are there to protect these people, writing things like on a wall, like graffiti, like looks like shit, smells like shit, must be a Bosnian girl. For, you know, talking about these women who just lost everything. They couldn't shower, or, you know, make themselves pretty or anything, you know, and so many of them were, sorry. It's okay, um, we, don't have to, we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. Yeah. I totally appreciate this is a... So, you know, they had, they had that graffiti of these women um, and, you know, making fun of them, essentially, women that they were supposed to be protecting, you know, and, and naturally these women are in horrendous conditions. A lot of them have been raped, some of them um, had survived, you know, horrendous camps, um, have just seen their loved ones, you know, taken away and murdered or just disappeared from them, never to return. Um, and so these soldiers that were supposed to be protecting them were making fun of them. So the UN has a huge amount of responsibility um, in regards to Bosnia. Not just the UN, but the entire international community because they had the evidence of genocides occurring as far as back as 92. And the governments um, of England and France in particular, unfortunately, did not want to get involved. Um, there was even a quote by John Major and uh, President Mitter Mitterrand, Mitterrand of something along the lines of that, you know, Bosnia did not belong and that a peaceful but necessary reconstruction of a Christian Europe had to happen, which was why they did not want to lift the arms embargo they did not want to get involved. They didn't want to help. They thought that, you know, well, they're a tiny country. They're mainly Muslim. Do they really belong? And why should we get involved? So they do bear a lot of responsibilities for what happened over there. I'd like for us to dig a little deeper into the, the chauvinism that we're just talking about, because mm -hmm. I know that you, you know, using rape as a weapon of war mm -hmm. is a recurrent theme in conflict. Mm -hmm. But there's also a very real, tangible consequence for the women who survive the genocide mm -hmm. that's particularly gendered in a way because most of the men have been killed. Mm -hmm. Could you dig a little deeper into that? Yeah, so and one huge part of my own studies um, in this was you know, rape as a, as a tool of war is particularly dealing with Bosnia and Rwanda, right? Uh, because mass rapes occurred. So f part of the Serbian strategy in order to enact this greater Serbia that would be free of non-Serbs, in particular the Bosnian Muslims and the Croatian Catholics um, and even the Romans and all the others that were living in Bosnia, um, was to kill the men because if you do that, the line stops, right? And the Balkans as a whole are a very patriarchal society as most societies are, right? So with that being, you know, if you get married to somebody of a different religion and you guys have kids, the kids are gonna be the father's religion, right? It's always that sort of thing. Or they're gonna, the ethnicity is the, comes from the father, not the mm. mother because again, patriarchy. So their, their pay, plan was, you know, kill all the men or as many as we can, especially those who are able to, you know, um, further, who are active. Procreate. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, rape the women. And, and with the women in particular, um, there were rape camps. They, were, they would just set up not concentration camps, but just rape camps, where girls as young as 12 years old would be raped repeatedly by Serbian soldiers. Um, there is a really great Bosnian activist. Um, she is from Visegrad. She has spent her entire life hunt hunting down 
the rapists who not only raped her, but her daughter as well in front of her, who was only 14. And so these stories, you know, are there. Um, and when these women tell their stories, they always, all of them, almost have the same sort of um, response. You know, this is what they were doing. And while they were doing it, they were telling me that they're going to beep the Bosnian out of me or they're going to put the Serbian seed in me so that it can be spread or, you know, just disgusting stuff like that. So obviously that's one part of the, the, the war and the genocide in general. It's, it's a tool. Um, in itself, the rapes are genocidal, basically. Um, and not only that, but even for the women who weren't raped, for the, for the older women, um, or even just ones who were thankfully too young, you know, um, even for them, the trauma stays because here you have you, right, a woman, um, your grandfather, your brother, your uncles, your um, father, your male cousins, anybody who might have provided protection prior to this is now gone. You are left completely unprotected, completely on your own. And on top of that, you know, you might be pregnant because huge amounts of these women did end up pregnant due to the rape. So it was cut off the head of the men and then ruined a woman. How important is it to be retelling these stories? Because it's painful. It's upsetting. You touched on, you touched on denial earlier. Mm. Can you elaborate on the importance of talking about these things? It, it's, I can't even explain how important it is. The purpose of genocide is to exterminate an entire culture, right? And if they fail at that, completely exterminating it, they're going to try again. And they're going to keep trying in some way or another. Genocide denial serves that purpose, right? Because that sort of historical re revisionism where, you know, well, no, 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 no. The, the camps at Omarska and Tenopola weren't really concentration camps. You know, they were labor camps. People could, you know, come in and they were refugee camps. They were just there and it wasn't that bad. Or, or, or even things like with the siege of Sarajevo. No, no, no. The, the Marakala massacres, we didn't do it. They did, and then they blamed us for it. Or here's why this, you know, it's, it's this sort of like conspiratorial, conspiratorial type of mindset. Um, and, you know, these propagandists really play to people who, who already are susceptible to conspiracies, right? Um, and the reason they're doing that is because they, it's not because they want to be the victims, and it's not because they know, you know, they, they want people to think that they didn't do it. It's because they want to be able to do it again with every genocide. I mean, with, you know, the Holocaust, obviously we stopped the Nazis, right? Hitler died, the Nazis came to an end, but a lot of those fascists stuck around and spread their you know, beliefs down from family member to family member. And right now we have a rise of fascism and we still have people who want to kill the Jews. And their main thing is always the Holocaust didn't happen, right? So if they're allowed to, they would most likely try to, you know, enact another Holocaust against the Jews. So genocide education is important. One, not just it, because it allows us to honor the victims and the survivors and the people who actually went through these, this greatly traumatic d ordeal. But two, because it allows us to speak truth to power. If we speak that truth, it becomes so much less likely that it's going to happen again to us. And not only that, most importantly, I think, either just whether or not it's happening to Bosnians or anybody else around the world. If I'm speaking my truth and I'm trying to tell people, this is what happened to me, this is what happened to my family, my friends, the people I love the most in the world. I don't want it to happen to you. So sit with me and listen to me and let me tell you 
all the ways that nationalism, racism, Islamophobia, misogyny can literally destroy you and your country. And so it's about warning others, really, so that we don't get to that point again. I think the point you make about sort of the grim certainty with which history can repeat itself mm -hmm. is so powerful. I also think it's what makes the the maxim ni vida never again of, of Holocaust Memorial Day so powerful because yeah. it is that challenge to sort of the cyclical nature of mm -hmm. history that these things shouldn't happen again. They won't happen again, or at least we can try to stop them right. from happening again. And I think that feeds into, we were talking earlier, not when we were recording, but about intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. something that we've seen in Native Americans and the consequences of colonialism mm -hmm. in America with uh, children, ceasefire babies in Northern Ireland, who despite having no direct experience of the conflict, are very much feeling the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. And I know whilst you have, as we've discussed, brutal first-hand experience of, of what happened, there are people, people who weren't born with children, are young adults now, who grew up not experiencing it first-hand, but certainly experiencing it in, in, a, in a sort of cross-generational -gener way, this mm -hmm. ripple effect. And I think that ties into, correct me if I'm wrong, that ties into the importance of talking about it mm -hmm. and retelling the stories. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, I, one big thing that I did when I was in school was study psychology, in particular post-traumatic stress disorder, in particular how it sort of gets passed down from generation to generation, even for those who haven't actually experienced it, right? So I am one of the last generations that has experienced it. The ones that have come after me, for example, like my brother who was just way too young to remember, he, he has no idea, right? His friends and then even younger kids, like my, my sister, my younger sister was born in 99, they have no recollection of it. For them, it's always been peace and stories, right? Um, and speaking to, to them and to that generation, I can already tell how it's affecting them, right? They might not have the, the same amount of post-traumatic stress that I do, as in, you know, when I hear fireworks, I freak out to this day. Um, but there is something there, a sort of sense of, of grief, that never really goes away. And that's the best way I think I can put it. It's a constant gnawing feeling and you don't really know where it's coming from. But whether it's Bosnians, Jews, Native Americans, Rwandans, it is difficult to gauge the amount of trauma all of us have experienced and to think that that wouldn't affect other generations. Um, just recently, Humans of New York, right, posted this really hauntingly, unnervingly beautiful story of a woman who's the daughter of a Holocaust survivor who was talking about how, because her mother had survived the Holocaust, she was never, she was really strict with them. And she would always say things like, I didn't survive Hitler to give you a bag of potato chips, or I didn't survive Hitler so that you could go do whatever you want, right? And it's a thing that, you know, even my parents do. God, my parents are amazing, amazing people, but they do it. They're like, oh, I did not survive the war and the genocide so you could go and, yeah. you know, embarrass me or something <laughs> like that. Completely normal thing. And for me, you know, luckily I was there, I remember enough, but Obviously, for those kids who don't remember, it sticks with them. And we, you know, as a community, we're not very vocal on like an international platform. There's, there's, I could tell you that the amount of Bosnian activists is probably a few dozen, and I know them all, and they're all amazing, but it's only a few dozen um, that are willing to actually get out there and talk about it and share our own personal stories because you have to have that emotional. Um, impact as well, so not just the academic. And I could sit here and talk to you academically about it, and you would be like, oh, great, great, great. But until I tell you, hey, no, here are the emotional effects of it, it probably won't leave as much of an impact on you, right? Mm -hmm. So 
back <laughs> anyway I'm back I'm on a tangent but back to the kids um, and, and, and the trauma that they're sort of going through that I don't even think they themselves quite understand yet when a war and a genocide happens it's quite well known in psychology and sociology that the aftermaths can be even worse than the war and genocide themselves right you have people who are traumatized now having kids because they haven't been able to deal with their trauma and heal from it that's trickling down to their children and they may be the best parents in the world but they're going to say something and do something that they probably wouldn't had they not grown up in the midst of a genocide or a war, right? I myself am a mother and I'm always so particular in the way I speak to my daughter because I never want to have her feel an ounce of that trauma that I experienced, right? So everything I do is extremely deliberate because I'm just like, no, 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 you are never going to see bombs. You are never going to feel bombs. And, you know, she has asked me about the war and I say it in the most academically detached way possible because I don't want her to worry about it and I don't want this to impact her life the way it has mine and that of my generation and the ones before us as well. With these new kids, um, you know, you have, you have issues of parents who survived concentration camps who are now alcoholics because they can't deal with the pain. That naturally is gonna impact them. Why are they alcoholics? Because of the war and genocide. That's one way it impacts them, right? The other way is those kids who get really interested in their own culture, so they start, like especially I've seen this a lot in the diaspora in the United States, you know, kids who were born in, after 96, 97, 98, 2000, you know, they want to know Bosnia, they want to know their their homeland, what happened there. So they start researching this war. They start looking at these videos. They start researching the genocide. They see the pictures. They start talking and asking questions of their parents or friends or whoever is older. That in itself impacts you because it's, wow, this is what my people went through. And then it also clicks for you, right? 2.2 million Bosnians were displaced during the war. They're all over. They're in America and Austria, Australia, Germany. They're away from their homeland because of this war. And I think one, I, had, I had a friend who, when she realized that, came to me and started bawling and was like, the reason I don't understand Bosnian as well as I should, the reason why I, I don't know how to joke the way that you do Bosnians have a very dark sense of humor. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's, it's because of this war and genocide. And it's stuff like that that really gets to you and you don't even realize it. Because it's like, oh, I, I'm here and I'm successful and everything's great and I'm doing really well. But, and everybody's done this. But what if it hadn't happened? What if there was no genocide? There was no war? Who would I be as a person? So it's this constant existential crisis that people are going through. And I've seen it, seen it in the um, Jewish community as well. Whether they're, you know, it, it's not just, it's not their parent, it's like their great great grandparent or, or somebody was in Auschwitz. It still impacts them and they're still asking those questions. And then you go to like the Native Americans, you know, the, the impact of the Native genocide and colonialism in general on the Native Americans. The fact that they're on their land, but their land is not their land, right? Not even on their own land at some points now. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, that, that stuff is going to have an emotional mark. It's going to leave a hole and you're going to spend your entire life chasing ways to fill this little hole. And, you know, you, you're going to be either one or two things, immensely lucky um, to where you maybe, you maybe end up like me, where, you know, the, your way to fill that hole is to just constantly talk about it and research it and get involved in, you know, organizations and try to prevent other genocides. Or you're going to be like somebody who just is going to do everything possible to feel that sense of security and peace again. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that ends up being alcohol, drugs, dangerous activities, you know, and, and loads of other things 
so that is like that the, that thing that people don't really talk about that that ultimately genocide is an ongoing project it never ends and it, re it really doesn't you know you look at the trauma that the Native Americans are dealing with still to this day you know not being able to be on their own land um, not being reeling from the colonialist schools where they suffered huge abuses um, you know reeling from people being racist to them and telling them things like go back to your own land where it's like oh I literally you mean the other way around right but you know it's stupid things like that um, to you know Jews who are now completely terrified of of fascism um, and being victims again to you know everything that's happening with Israel and Palestine that that is that is you know also part of intergenerational trauma and I'm sure other academics might disagree but you know I have no doubt in my mind that it's a part of it to Bosnians who you know are just stuck in an endless loop of you know burying their loved ones I just buried my my grandfather you know 10 years ago and I still haven't found a body of my uncle my aunts a bunch of our friends you know so I'm I'm constantly waiting for that phone call right of they found them and that's not just me that's so many of us so genocide is an ongoing project it never ends and genocide denial naturally contributes to that. How old is your daughter? She's eight. The best of luck thank to you. you and her, Anessa. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. I'm really appreciative. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>